Awesome. Then our next speaker wow. is Uday Jagadisan from uh, Pittsburgh. Take it away. Yep. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Cosine Organizing Committee for selecting this submission for a talk. It's an honor to be here. Uh, the talk is titled Causal Discrimination of Moment Generation Models Using Pattern Microstimulation. Uh, by the way, that's me as a young grad student when I still had hair. And uh, that's Raj Gandhi, uh, the PI of the lab and my mentor. The study was motivated by um, the sensory motor decoding problem, which is the need for a decoder to differentiate sensory responses in the brain from movement commands. For example, as we look around to scan our visual world, light enters the eye and is relayed to the brain where it's processed in visual areas and sensory motor structures like the superior colliculus in the midbrain. These brain areas communicate directly with the brainstem, which issues the final command to move the eyes to a different location. So these neurons, uh, here's an example visual motor neuron, fire distinct bursts in response to visual input and when generating an eye movement. So you see two, di two distinct bursts. Why don't we get a movement earlier triggered off this first visual burst? To get a better handle on this problem, we, sh we used laminar probes to record activity from a population of neurons in the superior colliculus. We record it from the intermediate layers, which have a majority of these visual motor neurons. This is a cross section of the brain region. We recorded activity during a delayed saccade task. Uh, don't worry about the details. Uh, the important feature of this task is that it separates uh, the time of visual input from the time when the movement happens. So you can study the two processes separately. If you look at the activity from all the channels in the linear probe, you see the same pattern as before. These are the firing rates for each channel in each row aligned to the target onset on the left and Sakar onset on the right for an example trial. Most of these neurons burst for both the onset of a visual target and during the movement. And many of these are the same neurons that project directly to the brainstem. So this poses a decoding puzzle. How does a downstream structure listening to the activity of these neurons know when to generate a movement? A simple explanation is that the activity needs to cross a threshold, either at the single neuron or population level, in order to produce a movement. This idea may be familiar to many of you from the decision-making literature. But you can reject that right away, because I can show you counterexamples like this trial, where even the population average across all these neurons, the visual burst, is higher than the activity during the movement. So any line you draw here will be crossed by the visual burst. There are other models that broadly fall under the umbrella of weighted population readouts. In the motor cortex, for example, it's been shown that you need activity to go into this optimal or potent subspace in order to produce a movement. But both of these are static readouts with little information about time incorporated. We are going to be talking uh, about a slightly different approach today that extends the idea of population states to look at the temporal dynamics of evolving activity. We'll see that in addition to where in state space activity lies, what matters is how it is evolving as a function of time. And see that the visual and motor bursts are different in their temporal properties. So here's a brief outline of the rest of the talk. I'll first talk about how you can estimate temporal dynamics and define a measure called the temporal stability. Then we'll use that to test whether the visual and motor bursts have different temporal dynamics. And finally, I'll show you results from a causal test using pattern microstimulation. So how do we quantify temporal structure? The idea is conceptually simple. We took our laminar recordings, the population activity, and constructed an n-dimensional population vector at each time point. This approach will be familiar to uh, many of you in this room. This vector is a function of time, so you have a neural trajectory that's evolving in state space. Each axis here represents the activity of one neuron. We then took each of these population vectors and normalized it. This normalization projects each point in this trajectory onto the surface of this ND hypersphere. Temporal stability is then just the inner product of two of these unit vectors separated by a parameter tau. You can change tau to get as fine or coarse grain an estimate of this measure as you like. So if this thick vector wiggles around a lot on the surface of this hypersphere between two time points, 
this dot product will be less than one, and the population activity will, will be unstable. On the other hand, if it doesn't wiggle around and keeps pointing in the same direction, the dot product will be close to one, and the population activity is stable. Okay, so we used this and applied this to our population recordings. And just to orient you, this is the average population firing rate for a few example trials aligned to the visual burst and the, uh, the target onset and the movement from one session. If you compute this dot product on individual trials, on each of these trials, and average across trials and sessions, you see that the temporal stability decreases sharply when the target comes on and goes the other way, closer to one during the movement, or just before the movement. So this normalized activity vector is wiggling around during baseline, starts wiggling a lot more when the visual input comes in, and becomes really stable just before the movement. So just to confirm that the firing rate did not influence this result, we saw the same pattern when we looked at just the trials where the visual and motor bursts were matched in magnitude. OK, so we asked whether the visual and pre-motor bursts have different temporal dynamics. And I showed you that the temporal stability decreases during the visual burst and increases during the movement. We then wanted to see if we can design microstimulation patterns um, with our laminar electrode to causally test this idea. Can we design stable and unstable stimulation patterns and see whether when you apply them in the brain, you see a difference in the evoked behavior? And that's what, that, that's what we're going to see next. Uh, before that, you, you should know that supra-threshold microstimulation in the superior colliculus evokes low latency fixed vector saccades. So we first identified which contacts we could evoke those saccades from, and then lowered the current and frequency parameters to sub-threshold values so that single contact stimulation could not evoke a movement because we want to do multi-contact stimulation. So basically, the parameters we, we used, and they're shown here for the aficionados, is they were near threshold for multi-contact stimulation, and that's important. We then used those parameters to create stable and unstable patterns. The stable pattern was easy to create. We basically used the ramp-up function to simulate a burst and scale the interpulse intervals drawn from these, this function for different channels. So essentially, the pulse rates, uh, so each line here, each trace here corresponds to a pulse train here, uh, uh, look like scale versions of each other. And uh, the tick trace is the average rate across all the channels. For each stable pattern, we also designed a corresponding paired unstable pattern, which was different only in its temporal structure. And this was done by randomly jittering these pulses across time or across channels within a window in such a way that the pulse counts for each of these channels were matched between the two patterns. By the way, these are the same channels 1 through 16 as before. And I've just laid them over each other. When you compute the pulse rates, they look like a big jumble. You can see that there is clearly no stable temporal structure in these traces. And the average pulse rate was also the same for the stable and unstable patterns. So these two patterns were used to stimulate on two different trials. So one trial got the stable pattern, and the other got the corresponding unstable pattern. For different pairs, we also randomized the channel-specific frequency assignments. So another pair of patterns may look something like this. In the first pair, the first channel has a high pulse rate, but it's low in the second pair. So we did this over and over again, this randomization, and generated hundreds of stable and unstable uh, pulse pattern pairs. This removed any systematic spatial structure in our uh, simulation patterns. So we've controlled for channel pulse counts, mean rates, and spatial organization, and isolated the difference between these two sets of patterns to temporal stability. If temporal structure plays a role in movement generation, we should see a difference in the behavior evoked when applying these patterns. OK, so we stimulated with these patterns when the animal was simply fixating in a task. And because the stable and unstable patterns were paired, we can use a neat trick. We can count how many times the stimulation evoked a saccade for each condition across the pairs, how many, how many pairs that happened for. So we put the number of pairs in which the stable pattern alone evoked a movement over here and call it N, S plus, U, S minus, where S stands for stable and U, S is unstable, and vice versa for N, U, S plus, S minus. We also had cases where both patterns evoked a movement, or neither did, presumably because we were essentially straddling the threshold, so you could go either way uh, uh, on, in some cases. 
but we are going to ignore those for the remaining analysis. You can estimate the relative efficacy of each pattern from this matrix by computing this ratio, n s plus u s minus divided by the sum of the two. So values closer to one mean that the stable pattern was more effective at evoking a movement. For those who are curious, these are the numbers that went into this calculation for this example session. And the gray point here is the permutation distribution obtained by randomly shuffling uh, the stable and unstable labels, essentially scrambling this matrix. We can then plot this for each stimulation session and sort the sessions by effect size. So this is session rank on the x-axis. For most sessions, as you see, the stable pattern was significantly more likely to evoke a movement than the corresponding mean and state matched unstable pattern. And even when it was not significant, uh, most of these trends were essentially in the upward direction. OK, so hopefully I've convinced you that the brain, the oculomotor system, can discriminate between stable and unstable stimulation patterns. You can then ask what part of the data this information for discrimination is coming from. You can condense the stimulation patterns into this matrix, where each row is a trial and each column is a channel. And each element here is basically the uh, pulse rate for that channel and for that trial. Is the motor system using these static features of the stimulation pulses, the pulse rates, or do you need information about the temporal structure, which is summarized as, which I've used just a scalar value to summarize it for the whole trial. We're gonna train a linear readout model, in this case, linear discriminant analysis, to label which of these trials produced a movement and which did not. We'll first train on the full matrix, the pulse rate for each channel and trial, so n of these dimensions, plus an extra temporal stability dimension. So we're presumably giving it the same information that the brain had about temporal dynamics. When we train the classifier, it performs well above chance for most sessions, almost mimicking the behavioral performance. So these sessions here are ranked by the behavior, uh, and you largely see the same trend. If you then take away the stability information and retrain the model on just these pulse rates, performance drops down to chance level. So a linear readout without the temporal information cannot decide whether a movement should be generated on any given trial. The take home message here is that temporal structure provides information about movement generation that a static linear readout alone cannot. Okay, so we then asked whether we can use pattern microstimulation to causally test the temporal stability idea, and the answer is yes. Stable stimulation patterns are more likely to evoke movements. And a decoder cannot get at this without looking at the temporal structure. Okay, so let's summarize. Hopefully I've convinced you by now that structure in temporal dynamics, that is stability of the population activity is important for movement generation. We saw correlative evidence for this in the population recordings. I showed causal evidence in the pattern microstimulation experiments. And finally, I didn't show you this, but it turns out that a simple biophysical model uh, that has dendritic temporal summation can discriminate between stable and unstable input patterns. I'll be happy to talk about this offline for those who are interested. Thank you. That was really interesting. Did you see where there were some temporal features that were important for the sessions that gave you a lot of discriminability versus the ones that did not? Was there something? So the patterns were designed in a similar way for all the sessions. The only things that changed were the current and frequency parameters. Um, but that's a good point. There should be some reason why uh, those had different performance. Uh, it could be because these were accurate penetrations, so I, I could have been in a different uh, region of the colliculus, right. which was better or worse at evoking movements, um, and which may not have this ability to integrate this temporal information. That was a great talk. Have you compared your measure of temporal stability to any measures of correlated variability, like Fano factor or something? Right, so we have. Um, and it turns out that uh, the Fano factor, in this case, for the superior colliculus uh, during the visual response increases. Um, but that's, uh, the, the key difference between uh, temporal stability and Fano factor is that Fano factor is necessarily computed across trials. So you, you could have a case where uh, the neurons are temporally stable across time within a trial, but they could be completely uncorrelated across trials. So you could have, those two measures are dissociable. Sure, thanks. Can I ask one more quick question? Um, great talk. I, I, it seems like there um, might be features in the, the pattern of the stimulations 
that could predict the spike, uh, the saccades um, that wouldn't have been picked up by your analysis. For instance, it could be the case that on a single channel, a burst of um, stimulations um, reliably predicts the saccades. Sure, yeah, 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 Th that's a great point. And that's uh, something an that we are- analysis could be like a saccade triggered average of the stimulation patterns. So, um, saccade triggered average of the stimulation patterns. Oh, I see, uh, right. So, if you look, go back and look at the stimulation patterns, it is actually the unstable case which burst of has only an a example lot of, of those, a lot of that burstiness. Um, this could be any particular pattern. Um, yeah, I haven't looked at saccade triggered average, but what I've looked at is reaction times, latency, saccade latencies, and it turns out they are largely, when the movement does happen, they are, are not significantly different between the two conditions. Uh, but that's a good thing to look at. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Well, thanks, Uday, and all the speakers uh, in the session. Thank you.